Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Zechariah 9, 9 through 11. It's the second book of the Bible right before the New Testament. Let me ask for God's help as we begin our time. Heavenly Father, I need you to help me speak your word truthfully, to help me speak it in a way that is understandable, and to speak it in a way that transforms us to be more and more like your son, Jesus. Help us to see in this text the beauty and glory of your son and what he's done for us, how humble he is in coming to us, becoming like us, dying for us, Help us also to see his, his majesty, his authority, his power in overthrowing our sin, in overthrowing Satan and death on our behalf. So may we start off this calendar uh, season of the Christian year focusing on uh, Christ's entrance into Jerusalem as he looks towards the cross and we, as we look towards the empty tomb. In Jesus' name I ask this, Amen. So we're stepping away from the series that Todd's been doing in Deuteronomy, and we're doing just a little uh, three-part series uh, on Passion Week. Passion Week is simply the week where we focus on the last week of Christ's life, when he rode a donkey into Jerusalem, then Friday he hung on a cross and died, and then Saturday, or Sunday, we celebrate Easter Sunday where he rose from the grave. So we're following this week where he comes in and the crowds are screaming, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. And they're calling him the son of David. He's the, he's the king who's come. And then on Friday, we, we fall as the crowds go to his trial and they yell, crucify him, crucify him. And he's hung on a cross. And then we come to Sunday where the disciples and the women come to the tomb and they ask, where is he? And then that's why we say he's risen. He's risen indeed. So I'm focusing on the, the prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9 through 11, that talks about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the reason why we have this Christian calendar, why we have these rhythms built in to what we do on, on Sunday mornings and, and Good Friday and Easter Sunday is because we, we constantly need to realign our hearts and our minds around Christ. Because I hope that if you've been here for any number of weeks or any number of years, that you know when it, when it comes to first free, what is first and foremost at first free is not doctrines or dogmas or rules or religion or regulations or whatever, you name it. That at the center of who we are and what we're about, at the center of Christianity, is a person, Jesus Christ. And so we have Passion Week as a way to remind ourselves that at the center of our faith and at what should be at the center of our hearts is a person, Jesus Christ. And so we want to constantly look at him and what he's done in all its facets, and just turn the diamond of the gospel and look and watch it shine. And so I'm going to focus today on his humbly uh, entering into this world and walking uh, into, or riding on a donkey into Jerusalem as he looks toward his death and resurrection. So you can think of not only Sunday mornings, but these, these regular, you know, Advent and, and Passion Week and, and different things like that as kind of the, the, the tuning fork for, for the orchestra, where you, where you hit the tuning fork to, to know what, what tune everyone should be playing at. And all the parts of the orchestra and you know, the choir, they all align their voices and instruments to that tune. And so that's what Sunday morning is when we preach. That's why we always preach Christ every Sunday, and that's why we have these regular um, you know, tr uh, calendar times of the, of the Christian calendar to tune our hearts to Christ. So let's dig into Zechariah 9, 9 through 11. And if you have your first free today, there should be a handout uh, with the sermon notes in there. And I, I filled in the blanks for you this week because I didn't want to have to pass out pens to everyone. So you can thank me later. So the first part of this text that I want to dig into is the first uh, part of verse 9. And my point here is, may our joy be massive. May our joy be massive. So reading from the first part of verse 9, it says, rejoice greatly. So this is God addressing Israel, through his prophet. He says, Rejoice greatly, 
O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. So the first thing that we're greeted with in this text is a call to joy, to worship, to rejoicing. And notice that in this call, when he is addressing his people Israel, he calls them daughter. Daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. That's just another way for saying daughter of Israel. And the historical context of what's going on with the people of Israel is that they've come out of exile, having been captured by a foreign nation. They're, they're back in their homeland, but they don't have a king and they no longer have a temple. So they're kind of in this transition period, wondering, you know, waiting, hoping for them to have a king, for them to have their own home, for them to have a temple where they can worship, and they have none of it. So it's almost like they're the child sitting in the crib, you know, wanting to get out, and he's wondering, you know, is, is daddy going to come and pick me up? And when, when God addresses them through his prophet and he calls them daughter, he's reminding them that he is their father. He's made a relationship with them. He has a covenant with them and he hasn't forgotten them. And that's why his prophet gives them this prophecy that he's reminding them. He's giving them a cold drink of water in a desert, reminding them that their king is coming. He, the, his, their father hasn't forgotten about them. And it's a call to joy, to rejoicing. And notice that the second part of my outline, the second part of this text, is all the reasons why they should obey this command to rejoice and to shout aloud. And before I get into the reason, I just want to note that in Christianity, we should be people full of joy, but not just because we're commanded to have joy, but because we have an infinite number of reasons to be joyful. There is substance and content and depth to the calls to joy and rejoicing. And I, whenever I am down or anxious or, or worry, you know, any, any number of those things that I do every week, almost daily, and there's, there's certain people that, you know, they come up to you and they say, hey, don't worry, be happy. You know, don't worry, be happy. And that reminds me of that song. And I, I forget who sings it. Um, but I, I, you know, I always remember hearing that as a kid, don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. And I wanted to find the guy who wrote that song and grab him by the collar and shake him and say, why? Quit singing that line and tell me why I should not worry and be happy. And thankfully in Christianity, in, in the word of God, it's not just these commands with no grounds for it, no reasons for it, but there's substance and depth in every text for why we should rejoice. And I'm going to get into those, but before I get into the reasons that sit underneath and fuel our joy, I want to note that as Christians, because we do have an infinite and abundant number of reasons why we should be joyful, that when we come on Sunday morning, when we um, are doing our regular spiritual disciplines throughout the week, when we're studying the Bible, whatever, it shouldn't be a game or an activity or emotion that we go through. It should be something that's rich and flowing from the heart and is fueled by this joy in a person we have. And in our culture, you think of um, Christian apologetics. And Christian apologetics is simply um, defending the Christian faith, giving reason or evidence for why we believe in Christ or why you know, Christ is right when he says he is who he says he is. But I think in this day and age, when we've moved a away from rationalism, you know, away from reasons and logic and all that thing being central, to more postmodern where everything's like, how do I feel um, you know, what does this mean to me? That kind of thing. One way that Christianity can be a beacon of light and hope into that type of postmodern subjective darkness is that when people, unbelievers, see our joy exuding from us and they see tangible evidence of the transforming, transforming power of Jesus Christ, it's something that's contagious that draws them. They see something in us that shines from us, this joy that we have in Jesus that transcends circumstances and trials and suffering and loss. And it, it draws them. It's something that they want that they don't have because in a culture that chases after money, possessions, power, pleasure, things that provide temporary, fleeting pleasure, people are looking for something with substance, with depth that goes deep and transcends all sorts of circumstances. And as Christians... We can be lights exuding joy, although not perfectly. It's not perfect. That's why we're not Jesus. That's why we need him. But when we are in relationship with Jesus, when we are drawing and abiding in him, drawing from his grace 
and that joy exudes out from us, it is contagious. I mean, it's the reason why babies are always cuter than adults. When you see a child and he's crawling around and everything's new, I mean, boxes become forts and cities rather than uh, things to throw away, and things on the floor are new discoveries to taste and touch and see and feel, and um, you know, buttons are something to press and watch light up, you know, rather than, you know, uh, energy wasters and whatnot. It's because there's, there's this joy, there's this sense of wonder and amazement and awe in a child that you don't, well, besides me, you don't see in an adult. <laughs> just kidding. But, you know, you just notice that when you, when, when you see little babies, there's something about them that draws you. And it's this wonder and awe and joy, and it's the same thing that should work itself out in us when we understand what Christ has done for us. And it flows before where when we let our light shine before others, part of that light should be the fruits of the Spirit, which include joy. (laughs) That is one of them that he works out in us. But it is a miracle when he does work it out because we are not naturally joyful people. We have um, second winter going on in March right now in Minnesota. So that takes away our joy. I mean, it was negative 10 wind chill recently, so that takes away from our joy. I mean, there's things like, for me, you know, buying a house and writing a big check um, for something, painting for hours, all these things that sort of corrode and chip away at joy. But yet, when you look to Christ and the fact that he has objectively, outside of whatever you feel or think or do whatever, he's come and done something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves, there is a rich, deep place to sink your roots and have joy. So may our joy be massive. So let's move into the second part of this text and look at the reasons for our joy being massive. So the second point I have here is because of our meek and majestic King Jesus. So may our joy, on the one hand, be massive, but underneath that upholding that is because of our meek and majestic King Jesus. And I use this phrase, meek and majestic, together um, to show the fact that in Jesus, in one person, we have someone who, on the one hand, displays infinite, full meekness, humility, lowliness, whatever you want to call it. And yet at the same time, he's majestic. He's the king. He's the ruler. He's the authority. He sits on the throne of the universe, ruling it. And he's worthy of all worship and praise and adoration. And yet they come together perfectly and he wields them on our behalf for our good to save us. And usually when you see someone who's humble, you think, well, that person probably has a lot to be humble about. Or when you see someone who's majestic, authority, you know, the, you know, the prince of England or whatever, the queen of England, you think, well, they are in a place of power and prestige and they have wealth and authority. And so, you know, someone just gave them that and they have it and they're probably not super humble about it. But yet in Christ, just as he is 100% God and 100% man, and yet one person, we have someone who is infinitely humble and meek and yet someone who is the king and the ruler and the authority of the universe. So let's see how our text draws this out. So I'm just going to ask the question of the second half of this uh, passage. How does King Jesus display his meekness and majesty? And I came up with seven answers, and we'll take them uh, quickly one by one. So first, he displays his meekness and majesty in his gracious initiative. In his gracious initiative. And I'll read the second part of verse 9 that says, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Or you could say righteous and showing himself to be a savior. So his gracious initiative. So when you think of a king, you think of someone who's got a, a palace or a, you know, a kingdom and they sit on a throne and they have a, you know, a kingly court and they have servants and whatnot. And typically what kings do is they call people to them. And they have people come and serve them, you know, shine my shoes, polish my floors, you know, clean my scepter, those kind of things. But yet, our King Jesus doesn't sit on his throne and call us to him. He gets off his throne and comes to us. Then in this text, we, we get a picture of the incarnation of Jesus taking on human form, taking on flesh, that he leaves his throne. He leaves his place of prestige and power and authority, and he enters this world and becomes one of us. That he looks at all the mess that is this world and all the mess that is us and he enters it. Rather than staying in his nice, polished, clean palace, steps off his throne, 
becomes a peasant and enters into our mess to save us. So we see his meekness and majesty in his gracious initiative. And then second, we see his meekness and majesty in his humility. Looking at the last part of verse 9, it says, Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is the place that most of the, the gospel accounts pick up the fact that a prophecy is being fulfilled when Jesus rides on a donkey. It's coming right from Zechariah 9.9. And there's a number of reasons why Jesus rides on a donkey. And I won't be able to get into the details of all of them. But just a couple of them are the fact that when Solomon was inaugurated as, as king, he rode a donkey into Jerusalem. And so what Jesus is doing when he rides a donkey is he's helping remind the people who would know their Old Testaments really well that someone greater than Solomon is here. A king that has more wealth to offer, although not physical wealth, who has more power than Solomon does, although not, it's not, this power is not of this earth. And that someone who has more to offer his people than Solomon is, is coming. And so they'd be reminded that when Solomon came on a donkey into Jerusalem, so now our new king, our greater Solomon, is coming in on a donkey. And then secondly, another reason why the donkey is significant and, and represents humility is that the people at the time when Jesus you know, walked the earth were being ruled by Roman authorities. And so when they were expecting a Messiah, a new king to come and rescue them, they're expecting a military power, someone who would come with an army to overthrow you know, this Roman rule and this oppression and to set up their, their kingdom right there on earth. And so you'd expect him to come on a war horse with an army or a legion of angels because they thought this, this person would be divine. They knew that. But they thought that he would use his divine power to overthrow a physical army. But yet Jesus doesn't come with an army or a war horse or any weapons. He simply comes on a donkey. I mean, the most unassuming, silly animal in the galaxy. And he rides on it. And these people are worshiping, still expecting him to overthrow them. But yet, he rides a donkey as a symbol of, I, I come not to overthrow an army with physical might, but I come humble as a servant. So he displays his meekness and majesty, his gracious initiative, and his humility, riding on a donkey. And then third, looking at the first part of verse 10, he displays his meekness and majesty in his power. He says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. So in these first two parts, we've seen that he's a king coming, becoming a peasant. He's riding on a donkey, humble, peaceful. And yet he still has power in this um, humility to cut off a chariot, a war horse, and a battle bow. All things that symbolize warfare, weaponry, those kind of things. And yet because of what he does in his state of humility, when he's, when he's weakest, he still can overthrow the weapons of warfare. That what Christ does in his work requires that we get rid of our weapons of warfare. That Ephraim has no use for a chariot. Jerusalem has no use for a war horse because Christ is the one who will fight for them, who fights their spiritual enemies and will one day when he returns fully and finally vanquish all physical enemies. And yet he accomplishes all this through riding in on a donkey and hanging on a cross and coming out of a tomb with no army, just himself and his humility. And then fourth, he displays his meekness and majesty in his global peace, that he provides global peace. Second part of verse 10 says, and he shall speak peace to the nations. And notice it's not only speaking peace and he's addressing Israel through his prophet, but this is something that will be for all peoples, all play, uh, you know, peoples from tri every tribe and language and tongue and nation. So it's not just for Israel the people he chose, you know, first and foremost, but yet what he's going to do will, will be of benefit to every single person, including us here in Minnesota in, you know, 2013. And that he offers us peace. And if you look at, you know, the news, you know, any given day, you, you know that we're at any place but a place of full and final peace. But yet what Christ does in his work is he first and foremost offers us peace with God, his, our Father. That when he dies on the cross, he is first overthrowing the most deadly enemy of all, and that is our sin and Satan and death. 
And that when he overthrows that, he gives us the peace that we need more than anything. That we, we don't just need peace here on earth physically, but we need peace first and foremost with God the Father. And one day, because of what he's done on the cross, not only has he given us spiritual peace by paying for our sin and overthrowing our spiritual enemies, but one day he'll come and fully, finally, forever offer peace uh, physically and we'll be able to live with him without uh, the prospect of any war, any suffering, any pain, any tears, nothing. Everything that represents um, suffering, uh, lack of peace, war, will be vanquished from heaven and the, the new heavens and the new earth. And so there'll be no more tears because of loss. There'll be no more pain because of suffering. There'll be no more worry because of lack, because we'll have it all because of the spiritual and physical peace that he offers us fully and forever because of his work in his humility. And then fifth, notice that he displays his meekness and majesty in his global reign. So not only does he come and let a crowd of um, Jews and Roman people cry crucify him and let um, Pontius Pilate offer him up to be crucified, uh, and offer peace to us through that. But one day he will come and he'll have a global reign. It says in the last part of verse 10, his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So it's through what he does on the cross in his, his weakness, in his suffering, that he will one day gain full, full rule of this whole entire earth. That's not only peace for everyone, but it's that every corner of the earth, every square inch of it, will be claimed as his and he'll rule over it. And there'll be no other presidents or prime ministers or princes or whatever anywhere because he will be the king and there'll be no need for anyone else to rule because it'll be his. And then six, notice he displays his meekness and majesty in his sacrifice. Looking at verse 11, it says, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you. And the phrase I want to hit on here is, the blood of my covenant. And what that should remind us of is the sacrificial system that God set up for his people to remind them of the penalty of sin and the need for a savior and a substitute. And it started when God made a covenant, a relationship with Abraham and promised to bless him, provide land and people for him. That when God, uh, to, to show that God was going to fulfill that covenant, God himself killed an animal and walked between it to show that if I don't fulfill my promise to you, Abraham, let me become like this dead animal here. And so it's a sacrifice saying that um, I am going, at the cost of my own life, I'm going to fulfill this commandment, or this covenant. And then also at the Passover, when God redeemed Israel from slavery to Egypt, he had them slaughter a, a lamb and paint it on the doorpost. And the angel of death passed over and didn't require uh, a penalty from those who had, you know, in faith, um, painted blood on their doorsteps. And it also reminds us of the sacrificial system that God set up, uh, exemplified in the Day of Atonement, where once a year, every year, the Israelites would have a special day where they would make sacrifices to pay for the sins they had committed throughout that year. And it was the one time a year that the high priest, who represented the people of Israel, would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would take... Uh, you know, the blood of an animal and wipe it on this thing called the mercy seat to show that, you know, God have mercy on us. You know, spare us and take the sacrifice. And those were just pictures, temporary pictures that showed that one day God would provide a real, a true sacrifice, one who was unblemished, who was like us so that he could be our true substitute, but yet who was unlike us so who could actually pay for our sin rather than pay for his own sin. And so this, this promise, this prophecy here is reminding them that this system, this sacrificial system that God has set up will one day come to fruition and it'll be, you know, this king will come and not only will he step off his throne and become a peasant, but he'll offer up his own life. He'll become one of us to die for us. And he'll, he'll rather than require and shed blood as a, you know, war hero overthrowing Roman rules, he will shed his own blood on the cross for us. And then seven, the last one before we move to application. 
is Jesus displays his meekness and majesty in his ransom of us. So not only is this sacrifice a, a substitute um, for us, but it, it does something for us. It, it ransoms us from a slavery that we have. And it's not just a slavery to foreign nations like the Israel had, Israelites had when they're in, in exile, but there's a greater slavery that we have, and that's a slavery to sin. And there's a slavery to death because of the, that's the penalty of sin. And what God did for Israel and Egypt when he redeemed them from slavery to Egypt was only a picture of what they truly needed done for them and that a savior would come and offer himself as a ransom to be the price to release us from the prison of slavery to sin. And so Christ offers his blood as a ransom price and provides his own righteousness, his, the fact that he obeyed all of his father's commandments. He offers that to us so that we can be released from our prison and clothed in righteous robes so we can stand before the Father ransomed, our, our sin cleansed, made white as snow, and our robes, um, our new robes given to us because of the righteousness of Christ. So he displays his meekness and majesty in his gracious initiative, stepping off his throne and becoming a peasant, in his humility, riding on a donkey, not on a war horse with an army, in his power, and being able to overthrow all the weapons of warfare, provide peace on his own, in his global peace, speaking peace to all people in all places, in his global reign, ruling every inch of this earth one day, in his sacrifice, offering his own blood instead of ours, and in his ransom, redeeming us from our slavery to sin. So I want to move to application. And what I want to focus on in this application is how can we uh, practically cultivate ways to let the meekness of Jesus mark us? So how can we be people who represent in humility our, our Savior who himself perfectly exemplifies what humility looks like? And before I, I get into the practical uh, application of that, I want to define biblically what is humility? What does it look like to be Christ-like and humble? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it here and then I'll, I'll repeat it. So if you're writing it down, bear with me. So Christ-like humility is God-centered so that's the focus of humility. It's God-centered and flowing from that, others-oriented. Others-oriented. And always acts in ways that are servant-like and sacrificial. So I'll state that again. So the focus of humility is God-centered and then flowing from that is others-oriented. And then this is how humility functions when it, when it works, when it acts. It always acts in ways that are servant-like and sacrificial. And so I'll break that down and, and say why I came up with that definition. So the reason I say the focus of humility is always first and foremost God-centered is because at the core of humility is an acknowledgement of the fact that God is God and we are not. And that sounds very simple, very plain, but yet I believe we functionally live, myself included, every day as if we are God and he is not. When we worry, when we have anxiety, when we're, you know, scrambling around to, you know, fit our schedules and make sure they work out properly, we're, we're almost in a way playing God. You know, we're worrying because things aren't, the planets aren't in orbit of our life. And, we're, and worry and anxiety is a reminder that we are not God. But yet usually when worry and anxiety comes on, that's when we try to control things even more. I mean, you look at it with whatever it's financial things, whether it's um, relational things, when we're always there's, there's things that are always causing us to worry and have anxiety. And those are God's little megaphones reminding us that you're not God and I am. And so at the, at the core of humility is, it a, is a God-centered focus, knowing that he is God and we are not. Humility is knowing your place in the universe and it's a very small one and that's okay. And then flowing from that, it's others-oriented. So we get first commandments first and second things will come second. And so we... We love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And the reason Jesus puts those two commands like that and summarized in the Old Testament is because primarily there should be a, a love for a vertical aspect where we are first and foremost about God. And we're seeking first his kingdom and righteousness. And then what will flow from that necessarily if we are truly loving and honoring God will be an other's orientation, a considering others more important than ourselves. And C.S. Lewis has said, if you get first things first, you'll get second things second. But if you put second, second things first, you won't get anything. And so we put first things first. We put God first 
so that there will be a flowing out of others' orientation. And if someone uses the excuse of not serving and sacrificing for others because you know, they, they want to honor God or being you know, God-centered and whatnot, you know there's wires not working because a God-centered view will always flow into an other's orientation. And then it always acts in ways that are servant-like and sacrificial. And we see this clearly in Christ that humility looks like a servant. It looks like someone putting on a servant's towel, bending down to wash feet. John 13, where he washes all the disciples' feet. And in that culture, when you're walking on dirt roads with sandals, it was only the job of a servant to clean feet like that. And yet Jesus says, uh, in giving a picture to them, that I am a servant, I will wash your feet. And then later, in the ultimate act of service ever offered in this world, he died on a cross to serve us. And at the same time, humility is always sacrificial. It does not ask, what can I gain? But it asks, what can I give to others? As Christians, we should always be people who move towards need, who move towards generosity, who move towards giving ourselves up. But yet, there's a struggle because we live in the culture and in the country that injects into our DNA um, a, a desire for comfort, security, uh, safety, entitlement. And so it's not natural for any of us to be servant-like and sacrificial. Yet, because of the work of Christ and humbly dying for prideful people like us, we can, through that power, become humble ourselves. And it is baby steps or maybe even snail steps, um, if you're me. So God-centered, others-oriented, servant-like, and sacrificial. So now, how do you cultivate Christ-like humility? How do you cultivate Christ-like humility? And one preface for this is it's impossible to cultivate Christ-like humility. But I won't end there. It is impossible in our own strength to cultivate Christ-like humility. That's why when Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. It wasn't just for those who, before they pray the prayer, apart from him, you can do nothing. Then once you pray the prayer, you can live in self-reliance and self-dependence and self-sustain. No, no, no. All of the Christian life is lived between apart from me, you can do nothing, and apart from me, you can do nothing. It's lived between those two things. And so know that cultivating humility is a miracle. It's literally a work of the Spirit. But when I give you application, don't think that, okay, that just means I'm passive and I sit there and wait for the puppet strings to start being pulled and, and then I'll be humble. No, we act in faith and dependence on God. That's why faith is also the other characteristic of the whole Christian life. We live between faith and faith. And we act as a way to say, God, I'm acting in faith and dependence on you and asking as I work that you would work in me. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2, 12, and 13, Work out your salvation in fear, with fear and trembling. That's a command. And then he backs up with this. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we live in this paradox of work, for God will work. So take application with that in mind. So how do you, make, how do you cultivate Christ-like humility? And the first couple ones I'm going to give are talking about vertically. How do we, in relation to God, cultivate Christ-like humility? And I am actually drawing from this book. So this is a book, it's called Humility, True Greatness by C.J. Mahaney. And I've read this a number of times and I'm still waiting for it to work, but little by little it is. And it's the most helpful book I've read on this topic. It gives a great biblical definition of humility and just super helpful practical application. And it's very understandable and accessible and I commend it to you. We have it in the library here at church. Uh, only one copy, so you might have to wait a couple years, but if not, come find me and I'll, I'll get it to you. So I'm, I'm drawing from someone who I believe is very humble and I've learned a lot about humility from. So don't take this as uh, something I've tried and tested and is found true. I've, I, this is from someone else. So how do we cultivate Christ-like humility? First, reflect on the cross. Reflect on the gospel. Let me just read some quotes from this book here. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote the following about the surest way to pursue humility. There's only one thing I know of that crushes me to the ground and humiliates me to the dust, and that is to look at the Son of God and especially contemplate the cross. Nothing else can do it. When I see that I am a sinner, that nothing but the Son of God on the cross can save me, I'm humbled to the dust. Nothing but the cross can give us the spirit of humility. John Stott helps us understand 
why the cross has this powerful effect. Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to be saying to us, I am here because of you. It is your sin I am bearing, your curse I am suffering, your debt I am paying, your death I am dying. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us, let me say all of us have inflated views of ourselves, myself included, especially in self-righteousness, until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. So reflect on the gospel, reflect on the cross. Second, express gratitude to God. Daily identify graces in your life and express gratitude to God. Thankfulness is a soil in which pride does not easily grow. Let each of us recognize every day that whatever grace we receive, and there are many that we receive, from God is so much more than we're worthy of and indescribably better than the hell we all deserve. So express gratitude. Third, study the attributes of God. Study the attributes of God. R.C. Sproul writes, the grand difference between a human being and a supreme being, God, is precisely this. Apart from God, I cannot exist. Apart from me, God does exist. God does not need me in order for him to be. I do need God in order for me to be. This is the difference between what we call self-existent being and us dependent being. We are dependent. We are fragile. We cannot live without air or water or food. No human being has the power to exist within himself. Life is lived between two hospitals. We need a support system from birth to death to sustain life. We are like flowers that bloom and fade. And this is how we differ from God. God does not wither, does not tire, he does not fade, and he is not fragile. So study the attributes of God as a way of seeing that he is God and you are not. And even in all these, I mean, pride can creep up and grow weeds at any, any point of these. I mean, you could become prideful about how much you contemplate the cross. You could become prideful about all the data you receive from studying the attributes of God. You could become prideful for how many uh, ways you can identify gratitude and, you know, you can start, you know, a huge March Madness bracket of who can understand gratitude better and whatnot. It can all become a competition. And that's why it is a miracle. So the, the battle with pride is not a um, let's fight for a little while and then we've conquered. It's one of those things where it's daily. Pride, it's not a matter of if it's there, it's a matter of where it is and can you identify it. So I just want to quickly move to how do we um, cultivate humility in relation to others, in relation to others. And I would say first, invite others to point out your sin and where you can grow. Invite people to intrude on your sin and pride because no one is more blind to my pride and your pride than we are. Sin is by its nature deceptive and it deceives 10 out of 10 people, including yourself. And so that's why we have a Christian community so people can come intrude on our lives and point out where we have pride. And the call for us is to humbly acknowledge that we are blind and thank someone for being, you know, gracious enough to point it out. In, in a land of Minnesota nice, it's nice to have someone who's willing to rebuke you as much as it hurts. Uh, another way, identify ways you can serve others and expect nothing in return. So we are kind of... Uh, ledger people. We, we exist with uh, credits and debits. And we usually keep track of what have I done for them and what have they done for me. But yet, humility says not what can I get or what can I get in return, but what can I give? And how can I give it freely? And so don't be a ledger legalist. Don't keep a record of credits and debits. Just serve and expect nothing in return, knowing that you have been served in the ultimate way by someone from whom you didn't deserve any service. And model that in return. So I'll end with that and let me pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us more than we deserve. We deserve judgment and justice and you would be right and glorious even in giving us that. But yet, in your mercy, you sent your son who stepped down from his throne, became a peasant and died for prideful people like us. And may we, by his grace, become humble people who live with contagious joy 
and exude humility because we have much to be humble about. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.